Good morning. My name is Brian Wesolowski, and I would like to warmly welcome you to the Church of the Ascension in St. Agnes. A special welcome to those who join via our live stream. We are all one in prayer. Today is the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, and our celebrant and preacher is the Reverend Canon Stuart Kenworthy. Just a few reminders. Holy Communion will be received standing and in the hand. Please follow the directional lead of the ushers, who will begin with the far side pews. Offerings and donations can be placed in basins located on either side of the center aisle in front of the first pews before receiving communion. Per the request of the diocese that our celebration be streamlined, the closing organ piece will serve as both recessional hymn and postlude. We apologize if ever you feel musically shortchanged. At the end of Mass, we request that fellowship conversations take place outdoors. Thank you for your attention. Our liturgy will begin shortly.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Let us pray, almighty and everlasting God, who in Christ has revealed thy glory among the nations. Preserve the works of thy mercy, that thy church throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in the confession of thy name, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
from the book of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I grasp to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you, and the level of the mountains I will break into pieces. Your treasure of darkness and riches in the secret places, you know that you may, <coughs> that this is I, the Lord God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob, who I call chosen, I call you by name. I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other beside me. There is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that they may know from the rising sun and from the west, that there is no one beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make real and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to thee, O Christ. The Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. I offer you these words in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Wherever I go now, I can see it in people's faces in the streets, at the grocery stores, in conversations. Three, three days ago, I met, whom I have not seen in a long time, our across-the-hall neighbor in our apartment building. She's a psychotherapist in DuPont Circle. And now, having worked remotely for many, many months, how are you doing, Mary? She paused and sighed and said, OK. Now, earlier conversations over these last years focused on how her patients were doing. But clearly, at this moment, the helper, the healer, was not immune from all that's going on around us. I think it is safe to say people are at the least feeling weary. For many reasons, layered across our societal, spiritual, psychological, and political landscape. The present pandemic in its eighth month, and it is, at so many levels, crushing people. Some seem immune, but most are not. For the last four years, maybe more, maybe going back eight, 12, They have yielded to something called identity politics, entrenched, embattled, oftentimes bitter. Our nation has reawakened as well to the profound racial matters that run deeply into our history and continue to manifest 
in our national life, which in principle enshrines the God-given inalienable rights of equality for every person. We could easily make this list much longer. For people of faith, we may wonder, and rightly so, where is God in this? Where is God in all of this? The people of Judah and greater Jerusalem certainly must have felt the same way. Because in 597 BC, and for 10 years following, the conquering Babylonians took the Jews into exile and captivity to what is present-day Iraq and to Babylon. The Bible tells us it was God's punishment for their idolatry and disobedience. Jerusalem, the temple, the center of Judaism was destroyed. For most, it seemed like the end of history. And for decades, they longed for a savior to rescue them. And it is that savior whom we meet through the reading from Isaiah today. His name is Cyrus, king of the Persians, who conquered Babylon and freed Israel from bondage, beginning a new exodus back to Jerusalem. You cannot overstate how astonishing it was that the liberator, who in that first line of your reading, in Isaiah, which you have in your service leaflets, is called the anointed. Cyrus was a non-Jew. He did not know Yahweh. And he was the only non-Jew ever to be called anointed. And over centuries was revered and loved greatly for liberating the Jewish people from Babylonian captivity. Cyrus didn't even know he was actively serving God's will and purposes, but he was. You know, most of us cra crave order in our lives, security, for life to be predictable. And we even want God to conform to that as well. However, what we discover in the Bible and in life is that God is mysterious, his ways inscrutable and complex. And this text shows us the God of surprises, whose ways are not our ways. This is a God who strides through history, who traffics, in the words of Isaiah, in light and darkness and weal and woe in life and death, and all the while declaring, I am the Lord, there is no other. This is what we know as the divine prerogative, mysterious and complex. Across the ages, there are countless witnesses who reveal this truth, those who make God's will known. For it is God who raised up Martin Luther King Jr. and placed him on a seismic divide of history, a prophet. He was a prophet for the heart of God, a sign of hope to our nation and peoples around the world. Yes, a God of surprises. Who would have ever imagined that day in 1995 at St. Jude's Church in Montgomery, Alabama, when former Governor George Wallace met with black Southerners repenting and reconciling. Coleman McCarthy in the Washington Post wrote, in the annals of religious and political conversions, few shiftings were so unlikely. Joseph Lowry said to George Wallace, 
that day. We both now serve a God who can make the desert bloom. It is often in the complex complexities, cross currents, and turmoil of life that we glimpse God in ways mysterious, unexpected, and surprising. And it happens today in the gospel where Jesus is again confronted, and this time by two groups, the Pharisees and the Herodians. The Pharisees, obviously, upstanding Jews, keeping Torah, attending to the law, capital L, the Herodians, Greco-Roman Jews who threw their alliance in with Rome, and Herod was appointed king of the Jews by Rome. So these two groups come to him. They have very little use for each other except in their agitation and desire to get rid of Jesus. Now this gospel is memorable. You could all probably relate the story right back. They want to know and hear Jesus answer the question, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? In either answer he gives, he will be caught, self-indicted. If he says yes, the Pharisees, to the Pharisees, he's selling out his Jewish identity. If he says no, don't pay taxes, the Herodians have him on sedition. They have him in a pincer movement. They think it's a fail-safe trap. So Jesus takes him to another level. Show me the coin. On it is an impression of Tiberius Caesar. To Romans, he is both the supreme political power and a deity of divinity. For Jews, it is the face on that coin of oppression, but more importantly, the face of blasphemy to call him divine. Violating the first and second commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no idols. So Jesus reframes their approach by saying, you know the line, everybody could finish it. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. To God, that which is God's. With this answer, with this answer, Jesus both names and limits what Caesar will get. He can have all the coins, they're all yours, Emperor. But Jesus says, Give to God what belongs to God. And where do we look to see where God's image is born? That would be you and me, our humanity. To the astonishment of those who tried to entrap Jesus, he has snared them in their own trap. And silenced, they depart. Now, we might think Jesus leaves us with a simple formula for understanding our responsibilities to both the state and to God. But in truth, he is inviting us to go deeper into the antithesis of conflicted loyalties which all of us have or will encounter in life. Now, we all pay taxes, hospitals, highways, housing for the poor, stoplights, fire departments, police forces, trash collection, defense, water mains, EMS, parks, shelters, disaster response, conservation, and on and on and on, it's an endless list. There's no inherent problem with this, paying taxes, but when the state, for whatever reason, comes into conflict with our loyalty to God in God's laws and gospel imperatives, there and then we enter a place where moral and ethical dilemmas create a struggle and call for time of decision. And we might ask again, when we are facing those dilemmas, where is God in all of this? Where is my first loyalty? There are large and obvious dilemmas and matters that are right before us all, like the decision to go to war or continue to prosecute a war, 
the quest for racial justice, our regard for the vulnerable, life, life at the edges, and the elderly, and the unborn. Years ago, the United States mobilized and deployed a very large military force into the Persian Gulf after Iraq invaded Kuwait. That mission had a name. Do you remember what it was? At first, Operation Infinite Justice. And there was a strong and quick response from Americans and our allies. The name was protested. The US, the United States, does not wield or bring infinite justice. Only God can do that. And shortly after, wisely, it was changed. For 23 years, as rector of Christ Church Georgetown, here in Washington, I had in my care and preached to people at the highest levels of government and public policy, whose views ranged widely. I determined early on, and I learned this as a curate in New York, where I served for many years, not to preach overtly political sermons. And I counseled my staff clergy to do the same. Sermons will, of course, have moral content and ethical content, but we don't necessarily connect the political dots. That's up to the faithful to do. But if they did preach an overt political sermon, I told them, choose it carefully. Prepare for some blowback and make a generous space for any response and ongoing dialogue. Of course, that line can be porous, uncertain, and I was not inhibiting their consciences of what God was calling on and asking them to do. It's good to remember a fourth century St. Augustine who wrote in the City of God, there is a constant mix of the heavenly and earthly cities, sometimes blurring our vision of which is which. We need to approach these dilemmas of life with a lot of humility, listening carefully, and seriously engaging with God and asking, where are you in this? To claim to speak for God ought to humble anyone. It can be a morally hazardous undertaking, and it ought always to be done with a plea for God's wisdom and grace and leading. In 2003, early in the Iraq War, there was a report on massive human rights abuses at Abu Ghraib prison west of Baghdad. These were carried out by United States military personnel and the CIA. It was explosive as this came to light, reverberating around the world. It was clear to me as both a priest rector and army chaplain to speak of this from the pulpit with the faithful. And so, with the Secretary of Defense present and many others in our parish, I spoke without pause or reservation to the evils and sin of such human conduct. Could that have been any clearer as to what to do? This matter and many others ought to rivet our attention and consciences, raising the questions, where are you, Lord, in all these things? Jesus, in answering those who try to entrap him, invites them, and us now, to a deeper dialogue, a deeper encounter with God, where it is morally and spiritually imperative to find God, to listen for God's voice and leading, to discern and make decisions about the order and nature of our loyalties as individuals, as people of faith, and as a community of Jesus Christ. And in that, to be drawn into a deeper relationship with the one who first 
not only asks, but commands this, to love God with all our heart and soul and strength and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourself. As we strive to find our way in this broken and beautiful world, we do so trusting in God's presence, trusting and believing in the kingdom of already in our midst and the kingdom to come. And all things, dear Lord, help us to see you, to seek you, to turn to you, for you are the Lord of all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for all our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us pray to 
that we may end our lives in faith, hope, and love, without suffering and without reproach. Let us pray to the Lord. In the communion of our blessed and glorious Virgin Mary, the holy patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, blessed Agnes, blessed Francis, and of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our Lord Jesus Christ, you have promised that when two or three are gathered together in your name, you will be in the midst of them. Hear now the prayers of your people, and what we have asked faithfully grant that we may obtain effectually for the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever.
Pray, beloved, that this my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Father Almighty. May the Lord receive this sacrifice of thy hands to the praise and glory of his name, both for our benefit and that of all his holy people. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is meet to give him thanks and praise. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places Give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we give thanks unto thee for the goodness and love which thou hast revealed unto us in creation, in the calling of Israel as thine own people, in thy word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, thy Son, Jesus Christ. In the fullness of time, thou didst send him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him thou hast delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before thee. In him thou hast brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks unto thee, he brake it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Whenever you do this, drink it for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And according to his command, O Father, we offer unto thee this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, for 
presenting unto thee from thy creation, O Lord, this bread and this cup. We beseech thee, gracious Father, to send thy Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to thy Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. At the last day, put all things in subjection under thy Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with the blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Agnes, and all thy saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Behold him who taketh away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy of thy but speak to me only in thy soul.
us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank Thee for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of Thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of Thy Son and heirs of Thine eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work Thou hast given us to do, to love and serve Thee as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to thee, and to the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and all beloved to you this day and forevermore. Amen. Thanks, Peter.